Kurt Jamungal, welcome to the Samuel Andreev podcast. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, it's a pleasure to get to talk to you again. I wanted to give my viewers a little bit of a background on who you are. So actually, I don't know how much overlap there might be between our respective viewerships. Probably not much. So maybe this will do something about that. So we met at the art conference in London, and I received uh, a message from you via the, the ARP app, uh, app, rather, saying that you were interested in, uh, in a conversation, So, which was very, very interesting, and I really enjoyed meeting you. But I'm curious to know what motivated you as someone with a background in mathematical physics at such an event to reach out to someone like me. Okay, well... <laughs> So I spammed many, many people at just based on what was what was interesting to me at an intuitive level. And so I can't recall specifically, but <laughs> yeah, I don't have a great answer for that. I apologize. But I do Not at all. I do remember you from years ago because you were interviewed on some podcasts and and you're a a notable person. So I was interested in speaking with you. Okay. Well, but I don't I recall did... the exact reason other than that, that I messaged. Well, it was a crazy event. We should probably point this out to people who don't know what the ARC conference was. It was, a, it was insane. I mean, there were so many interesting people uh, packed into a comparatively small space, you know, over a few days. It was, it was crazy. The, the, just the, 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 the number of fascinating discussions it was possible to have at that event was, was unlike anything I've ever experienced, really. So maybe we could start there though. Like how what was your experience of Arc? What what were you expecting going into it and and what was your takeaway from the event? I wasn't I didn't know what to expect. I went into it with just thinking, okay, this is where there'll be plenty of interesting people and I was more interested in meeting people, hence the messaging of people than I was in any any of the lectures outside of yours which I think it's one of the best ones that people should watch on the ARC YouTube channel. I'll plug you even if even if you don't plug yourself. There's a video of yours on on the place of an artist in society, I believe. Maybe your editor can place it on screen. Yep. I think yours was the only one that I left a comment on of all of those videos. So I was more interested in meeting people than I was in sitting and watching a lecture that I could potentially see online. And mm -hmm. that's where I met you was in the other room in an adjacent room where people were going and getting coffee and biscuits and so on. I just right, hung right. out there and I found that to be, I loved that. I remember when it was ending, I was like, oh man, I wish this was just one more day or one more night or some event afterward. Yeah. In a sense, it was almost too much. Like there, there wasn't actually time to, to get to everybody you wanted to talk to. And there were a lot of rushed conversations and you'd start talking with somebody fascinating and then, you know, you'd get pulled away or they'd get pulled away and it would be, it would be uh, interrupted. So yeah, no, it was, it was uh, certainly an incredible event. I had no idea what I was getting into when I agreed to speak there. No idea whatsoever. I didn't have any concept of the magnitude of it, of the sorts of people that would be there. Uh, and I didn't really exactly know what was expected of me, what my role there might be either. So I kind of figured that out as I was going along, but it was uh, certainly a Certainly an incredible adventure. Were so, you nervous? Well, yes. Once I got there, I, w I started to really wonder, <laughs> what exactly, wh why have I been asked to do this? What's my role? Uh, what can I do that would, be, that would be useful in this situation? You know, because listening to the first couple of days of talks and realizing that most of the speakers were either politicians or intellectuals uh, or you know, it's like, well, here I am. What am I going to do? Mm -hmm. So, so that was that was daunting. It it eventually did become clear to me why I was there and and why that could potentially be useful. Uh, and it was also extremely important to me as an artist to be present at something like that, because one of the things that we talked about in London, maybe we could jump off on this for a second is that there are so many amazing podcasts happening right now with increasing production values, with fascinating guests. Uh, and this is something that, of course, is impossible in the mainstream media. I mean, they're just simply not doing this. And, you know, that, that's something that's already been discussed at great length by, by many other people. But so, the, so that's a format that's possible now. 
and you can monetize it, and you can potentially do it for a living. But I was struck by the fact that there's very, very little in the way of discussion of the fine arts on most of these shows. So as somebody whose entire life is devoted to music, specifically, that was something that was very important to me, not for my own personal glory or my own fame or anything like that, but it, but I wanted to to represent a kind of ambassador for the arts, for, for the art of music in an event like that, to make sure that artists are not completely forgotten in this broader and, and really urgent and vital cultural conversation, but that we have a seat at the table. So that was my motivation. What constitutes motivation. an artist? What constitutes an artist? Well, that's an interesting subject in and of itself. Um, I think you have to draw a distinction between an artist and an artisan. So for me, that would be the starting point. Point. So an artisan, as far as I'm concerned, is somebody who, who learns a body of techniques and methods in order to produce something that is, what would you say, that is consistent in its fabrication. And so you, you, can, you can produce a consistent, high-quality product or service. Uh, and you can, you can take that body of techniques and, and knowledge and know-how and pass that on. So there didn't used to be a division between artists and artisans as such. You know, the, the, the artist, the composer, the painter, whatever it was, had no particular special status. Uh, and that started to change at different time periods in different art forms. Uh, it happened arguably a little bit earlier in painting than it did in music. So a composer like Joseph Haydn, for example, was, had the status of a, of a servant, effectively, at the uh, Esterhazy Palace, where he was employed, so there was no idea that oh, this is a this is a creative genius. This is uh, somebody who has uh, insights that nobody else has. That's I think fundamentally our our current understanding of what constitutes an artist is really a romantic idea. It's a nineteenth century idea, and it's the idea of a, an individual who is liberated to some degree from the constraints that bind the rest of us in society. Somebody who uh, is perhaps not the same as others who has a personal, subjective vision that they're putting out with their work, and who, in doing so, can enrich our culture, perhaps give us perspectives we didn't have, potentially a form of knowledge that we didn't have, or potentially uh, tap into aspects of the human psyche that would not be articulated otherwise. So that would be a starting point. That latter definition seems extremely broad to the point that it encompasses someone like Stephen Wolfram, who's a, comput who's a computer scientist. Uh, well, he's, he runs a company, but something like a physicist slash computer scientist. So when I think of artist, I think of something to do with music or painting or, or poetry, but you don't see it like that. Well, that would, be a, that would be a starting point. That would be making a, a, a division between something that is iterative and uh, predictable in nature, which is what happens with artisanal cultures, and something that is more about personal expression, let's say. So I think in, in the Western world, the concept we have of an artist is deeply tied up with the idea of personal individual expression. And of course, when we use the term artist, generally speaking, we're referring it to people working in whatever medium it is, whether it's music or literature, or poetry, filmmaking, all of these things. But I think what makes somebody an artist, well, there's a few things. Uh, uh, trait openness seems to be a huge part of it. So almost all of the artists that I know, without exception, are absolutely off the charts as far as openness goes. And, um, well, that plus a desire to explore and to make things. And that can be channeled into all kinds of different things, right? You can, you can have the temperament of an artist and be a software designer or be a chip designer or whatever. It doesn't, I don't think it even necessarily matters that much what the ultimate result is. So, uh huh. Uh huh. So, you can be a physicist artist because, in the physicist case, they're trying to capture the objective world, which is different than themselves. It's not exactly personal expression. Maybe personal expression comes through, like Feynman had, a, had an affinity for particles and so invented Feynman diagrams to save particles from quantum field theory because he wasn't a fan of the field concept, wanted to bring back the corpuscular. 
So you could think of that as, well, I'm bringing my own traits into the physics. But is that seems so tenuous compared to to other forms of expression like like a pianist. Mm -hmm. Well, I take it as an article of faith that there are experiences of beauty and perhaps even of subjectivity in some of the more esoteric branches of physics and mathematics that are accessible only to people that understand those things properly, of which I am not one. So my sister teaches condensed matter physics at the University of Memorial in Canada. So she understands things that I can't even begin to fathom. Like I don't understand what her life's work is. It's, it's opaque to me. But mm -hmm. I've heard many times, mathematicians particularly, but also physicists, uh, describe what sounds eerily like an experience of aesthetic beauty when they describe their, uh, their interactions with and understanding of mathematical and physical concepts. So that's, that world is opaque to me because I don't have that specialized knowledge. But they say it's true, so I'm willing to believe that there's a, there's a grain of truth to that. Yes, yeah. I would say there are beautiful equations and then beautiful proofs especially. So for people who don't know my background, it's in mathematical physics. There's a book called Gödel Escher Bach, and in it, the author Douglas Hofstetter, who was a physicist and now is a philosopher slash linguist, cognitive scientist, he demonstrated with in, in text form the beauty of Bach, at least one aspect of the beauty of Bach, in fugues especially, and said that fugues can be understood backward as well. Now, I don't recall the exact argument, maybe you do, but mm -hmm. that was a taste I had for something that I... some beauty, some beautiful quality in music that I wouldn't have had access to because I don't know it in the same way that you don't know certain manipulations of symbols. So don't see why some symbols can be more generative or, or awe-inspiring than others. Yeah, it's a fascinating book. I read that quite some time ago. And I mean, the, the book as a, in terms of the general topic of the book, I would say it's, it's it has to do with what recursion, infinite regress, ideas like that, and, and how they manifest in the physical world and also in abstract art forms like music. Um, and actually, that was one of the books that got me really interested in Bach. So it's funny you mm. should mention that, because I'm going back a little bit of a ways here. I think I was 16 when I read that. And his descriptions of the arcane contrapuntal processes in Bach, particularly in uh, the musical offering and a few other works from his later period, that was an eye-opener for me. And so it, it's funny, actually, that my own experience of music was deepened and broadened by a book written by a mathematician. So that's quite interesting. But where I want to take this, Kurt, is that there's something that uh, I'm really curious about. And, and I think you've touched upon this in your new nearly three-hour video on string theory, which I've watched in its entirety. And wow. the first thing, yes, well, the first thing, the first thing to say about that video uh, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, give us your perspective, is that it, it strikes me as one of the most extraordinary things I've ever seen on YouTube. I can only begin to fathom the amount of effort and work it must have taken to produce this. The video is called The Iceberg of String Theory, and it sort of takes you through layer by layer into the arcana of, of string theory. And I'm not going to tell you that I understood all of it, or even most of it. At, much of it was opaque <laughs> to me. But... This is where I think there might be a parallel between our fields. So the impression that I got from the video afterwards was that here's, here's a discipline that produces no tangible result in the, in the real world uh, that seems to be, I mean, if you wanted to be blunt and sort of a, uh, unpleasant about it, you could say, the purpose of string theory is to keep a lot of tenured professors uh, in their positions. So it seems from the outside like a tangled mess that has very little uh, identifiable connection with anything we would consider to be reality. And I think, well, first of all, I, I would be curious to know if you would share that impression, at least to some degree. And then secondly, we could talk about how I think that that may connect with some of the things that are happening in my field. 
So let's, let's start there. I don't share that impression. Any more so than any other branch of theoretical physics. So there, there's the main competitor of string theory called loop quantum gravity. And they also haven't produced anything that's tangible. Almost, and then there's causal dynamical triangulations and various other approaches. It's so far from what can be tested, at least we think. There is also the argument that could be, there's also the argument that it may be that we already possess the data to discern between these different theories. It's staring us in the face. We just don't realize it in the same way that in the 40s or so, they were receiving signals from super massive black holes and didn't know what they were. It, only until later, when the theory was developed, did we realize how to interpret the previous data. So it could be that. It could be that it's right there. We just, we don't know. It looks like noise to us, something that we filter out, or something that's unexplained. There are a variety of physics problems. That may be another iceberg, the iceberg of, of physical problems. There's like 100 of them that are fairly uncontested as problems. So I share what you're saying, except I would generalize it even further. Now, condensed matter physics is sometimes seen as a subset of theoretical physics, and that would be the only place where there's actual application. So the condensed matter physicists are working on something, are working on actual technology. Oh, good. So, so my sister won't, so be, close won't, be, to, won't no. be too annoyed with me. Right, right. <laughs> no, no, no. She, she, she's one of the few exceptions. And what you just said about string theory could also be said about philosophy. So I was just speaking to someone who is a paraconsistent philosopher. What is paraconsistent? Well, let's talk about what is logic. Usually, when we speak about logic, we're speaking about classical logic. And that's the logic that Douglas Hofstadter takes for granted in, the, in his book, by the way. Gödel's incompleteness theorem is based on classical logic. Classical logic traces its roots back to Aristotle, but it differs. And it doesn't matter. It was inspired by something that was inspired by Aristotle. Classical logic says that for any statement, you can assign a truth value to it. It's either true or it's false, presuming it's well-founded, because you could just say gibberish, and then you, you don't know what to do with that. So it's either true or false. Let's imagine you have a well-founded well statement. And then there is no middle ground. It's either true or it's false. That's called the law of the excluded middle. They say there is no middle, so I'm going to exclude it. The law of the excluded middle. In other words, there's just true, there's just false. If I hand you a statement, you can say it's correct or it's incorrect. And there, is, there are intuitionist logics which say that, yes, sure, you could have red and sorry, true or false, but you can also have a third way, and that's in essence, intuitionist logic. Paraconsistent logic is that you can overlap these, that some statements in the real world are actually inconsistent. They're true and false, or they're contradictory. And then you can follow this further and you can get to delineations and distinctions that you would need to study for months to, in order to be able to understand it, let alone argue with them. So I was speaking with a philosopher recently about some of these issues. And then I asked him at the end, I'm like, okay, everyone is listening. They've followed you so far. They're thinking now, so what? Like, even if what you're saying, Graham, Professor Graham, is correct, like, what are, how are people supposed to change their lives because of this? Then he said, he thought about it and he said, I don't think they, <laughs> I don't think this affects them at all, unless it's just in some inspirational manner, like, hey, what we thought was the case may not be, and then that can provide some hope for people who are struggling with a difficult problem, unless you go that abstractly. So, in other words, the fault that you laid correctly to the theoretical, to the string theorist, I would generalize to the theoretical physicist, excluding the condensed matter physicist, and even Naturally. further to the philosophers and many other departments, including pure math. I'd like to just briefly jump in here and say that this channel exists because of the support that I receive on Patreon. If you are a regular listener and would like to see more of what I do, please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com slash Samuel You'll find the link in the video or podcast description. 
You'll get exclusive previews, the ability to submit questions, CDs, sign prints, and more. But you can also support my work by subscribing to the channel, liking the videos, or joining in on the discussion through the comment section below. Thanks for watching, and let's get back to the interview. Yeah, so, so what do you think would be the point at which one has to conclude that a given uh, area of investigation is just not bearing fruit? You know, because... I don't know. Sorry, because what? Well, some will say that, that research, uh, you would expect most of it not to lead anywhere, right? But it's, let's say that there's a tenth of a percent of it that ends up being productive, and that it's difficult to predict where that tenth of a percent would occur. So you could arguably uh, justify the entire endeavor on the basis that, well, there's an infinitesimal chance that this will, in fact, lead to some kind of what material or spiritual improvement of the condition of people, or it will add to our knowledge. And there's an overwhelming chance that it won't. But let's take that tiny chance. You know, it's, it's sort of like uh, what Musk said about starting a rocket company, that that failure was the likely outcome, but it was important to try anyway. So how far can we push that, do you think? Well, you could push it to Pascal's wager and say that it maybe it's the most infinitesimally infinitesimally small chance, but then has the in, has an infinite value of a of a plus associated with it. And then you can justify almost anything. So at some point you have to put finite bounds to them. The issue for me isn't isn't about exploration. It's about where does the money come from? And for most, many of these universities, they're publicly funded. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, there, there are these soci sociological factors that come into play where the string theorists gain some prominence and then they get to decide what's considered fashionable and who gets hired, even in the private institutions. So that's, the, that's my gripe. So what you're doing, by the way, which is you're putting yourself on the line publicly. And if people want to watch, they can. And if they don't, they don't. And, and they will voluntarily give you some money, voluntarily, like through Patreon and through YouTube ads in the sense that's, in some sense, that's voluntary. I think we need more of that. And then there's also extreme transparency with what you're doing and your motivations and your failures because it's live streamed. Stephen Wolfram also does that. He live streams mm -hmm. his work sessions. I'm a fan of that. But then if everyone was to do that, it would become, well, we're already in an overabundance of podcasts slash mm -hmm. live streams. So then it would become too much. But in some sense, then you get direct attestation from the gov from the public so I'm more of I'm more a fan of that. And when I my gripe with string theory lies primarily with that, with the sociological factors and the fact that some of the money is gotten to from public means and the public doesn't even understand. Well, maybe now a bit more so from the iceberg of string theory, hopefully, but the public doesn't understand where their money is going toward. They just trust. They have to trust these Incredi incredibly bright people. Right. Okay. Okay. So th there's a couple of things there. There's a there's a political question of well, do you do you believe in the in the the allocation of public funds for things that probably most people don't understand, will never interact with, and and uh, have no ability to assess? So that's that's one thing. But then there's the other question of what does that end up doing to the field ultimately if uh, it's allowed to become this very circular thing where you have a small group of people and a small group of peers uh, who wield a great deal of influence and are able to determine where the funding goes, where this public funding goes. And it sounds like that's an issue in the sciences and it's also certainly an issue in the arts. And that's, uh, that's something I've been contending with myself recently because I've made a decision and it wasn't exactly a snap decision or something that I just came to overnight, but a gradual realization, let's say, that uh, part of... I think part of the problem that a lot of artists are facing is the fact that there is almost no connection whatsoever between the people that are ostensibly funding the work and then the people who are making it and the people who ultimately end up viewing it or hearing it. There's a total disconnect between those things. 
with the public funding model. And um, I don't think that that's sustainable over a long period of time. I don't think that uh, uh, that small um, funding bodies allocating various amounts of money to individual artists is a long-term solution that's really viable uh, to keep the arts thriving and and prosperous. I don't think it works. So, have you ever been? In, have you ever stayed in Canada, Sam? Stayed in Canada. Yeah, well, I'm from Canada. Oh, right, right. Okay, so you know about the I'm Ontario. From, I'm, from, or, I'm from the same town as you, man. I'm from Toronto. Okay, <laughs> okay. I thought you're from France because you're there now. I've been in France for 20 years. I'm I'm in the process of becoming a French citizen, and uh, I my, see. I see. My my children are born here, uh, and uh, yeah, no, I, I have, I'm very. But no, no, I'm originally from Toronto. I lived in Toronto until I was 21 or 22. There are various government grants for artists in Canada. What do you make of that system, the grant system? Ah, okay. So when I was 20, 21, um, and starting my career, I was certainly in favor of it. And I had a lot of artist friends in various different disciplines, writers, painters, poets, and so on. And it seemed like, you know, who could possibly... Who could possibly have a, an issue with a system like this? You know, you would you would say, you know, compared to any other aspect of the of the budget in Canada, the government budget, you know, the amounts of money in the grand scheme of things that might be allocated to the Canada Council for the Arts are are extremely small, right? Compared to defense spending or infrastructure or anything like that, we're talking, you know, really quite uh, minor amounts of money. So it's not that's not so much the issue for me. It's not like because it doesn't, it probably doesn't really affect the national budget in any significant way, one way or another. Whether you give ten million or twenty million here or there, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers right, are. Right. So what's the, the issue council. then? Well, the issue is the effect that it has on the field as a whole. So there's a few things there that uh, that I would uh, I would present as potential issues. So one of them is that you can, or at least you could, in Canada for a long time, uh, starting in the centennial year, 1967, where there was a huge push. Uh, this is when uh, Trudeau was, the first Trudeau was prime mm, minister. Okay. And there, was, there was a huge push uh, to, uh, to advance Canadian culture. You know, they called it CanCon or CanLit, Canadian literature. Uh, and there were a few reasons for that. One of them was this idea that we don't want to be overwhelmed by our vastly more numerous neighbors to the south with their vastly greater uh, financial means and their vastly more developed culture, which is true because, you know, there, there are simply more people there creating culture by a factor of 10 or so. Uh, so the idea was Canadian culture is this emerging thing and it's fragile and there's not as many of us and we could easily have a situation where you turn on the television and there's nothing but American shows. You go into a bookstore and it's all American and British literature. So there was this idea that, okay, well, let's, level the playing field a little bit for Canadian artists. They're at a kind of automatic disadvantage. So let's uh, let's invest in this. And to be fair, there were some really remarkable artists that came out of that. There was a period in the 60s, late 60s, 70s, arguably into the 1980s, where there was quite a lot of public money floating around for artists. It doesn't mean that they were having an easy time. It doesn't mean that, you know, they didn't face their own struggles, of course. But Nevertheless, that did result in the production of a lot of artwork. Some of it was terrible. Probably most of it was terrible. And a small amount of it might not have come into being otherwise and was really excellent. So you'd say, well, what's the problem with that? You know, there's, there's, there's no particular downside. But the downside, the downside I see is a, is a couple of things. One of them is that, and I think this is a, an obvious point, it's very, very easy for such things to become captured ideologically speaking, you know, because if you have a relatively number, small number of people controlling the public purse that gets distributed to artists, uh, and you have NGOs pressuring them that are answerable to no one and they're not elected, then it's very, very easy for that to turn sour. And I think that is something that has happened, in fact, uh, increasingly so in the last couple of decades. So there's that dimension. And then there's the effect that it has on artists themselves. One of them is that it, it, it insulates them from the pressures of the marketplace. And mm -hmm. a lot of artists will tell you 
what's wrong with that? That's desirable, right? right? We don't we don't want to be involved in the cultural industry making mass market entertainment and and uh, making a profit from our work. We want to be free. Right. It sounds to, like it's a favorable factor, a virtue. It sounds like a virtue, right? Exactly. In other words, aha, uh-huh, I'll be freed from the chains of adherence to this commercial culture. I'll be able to produce my work uh, without that. But that turns out to be, in my view, a fatal mistake. Because if you look at the the history of the fine arts, there was no point in history ever where artists were freed from those chains. That has never been the case. They've always been beholden to commercial pressures, certainly, to the pressures of those who were paying them, of patrons, whether it be the aristocracy or the nobility or whatever. Um, And there are mediums also like opera, for example, that are phenomenally expensive. Um and in which commercial pressures are gigantic, which forced composers, in a sense, to reconcile the what I would call the savant styles, so the, the most advanced, the most sophisticated uh, technical uh, understanding of music, with popular styles. Those two things could be brought together. And so you have opera emerging as a result. It's, it's both a popular medium, and it's also it can also lay claim to the highest... Uh, sophistication possible and the, the most noble expression of our species. And what you see, though, I think, is if if the public funding model becomes generalized, then you get completely cut off from that and you get this increasingly artificial culture with no connection to anything. And it can very easily become a very closed circle of artists appreciating other artists, mm-hmm, but never mm-hmm. outward facing. So that would be that would be my take on the potential downside of that model. What do you think, Kurt? Well, one of my favorite artists is Leonardo da Vinci. And if you read his biography, it's often, well, here's what's most interesting. I think it was the Medicis he was trying to gain money from. And he made a resume of a sort that survived. And he said, okay, what I can do for you is I can build you weapons of war. I can also architect your buildings. I can also create some technologies. I can also tell you about sewage systems and how to more efficiently create them. And he writes a litany. And then at the end, and he said, I'm, I'm also an artist, just so you know, like I can also paint. And that's like, we know him as a painter, but he had to supplicate to, to the government or to the, to, the, to the big boys, to the big daddies who had the money. That's extremely interesting. And all of his, all of his work out, outside of the Mona Lisa was commissioned. So the, the work that, so it's, it's interesting because you provide the thought experiment to the lay public who doesn't know much about art. Who's, a, who's an artist you appreciate? And then they'll say Michelangelo or, or Bach or Beethoven. And then you'll also ask the question, perhaps you should ask it prior. Do you believe artists should be freed from the strictures of, the, of, of having to produce for money? And they'll say, oh yeah, of course, of course, it's a boon. And then you ask them what your favorite artists are or the or your favorite products of art. And almost and invariably it'll be tied to the market. So mm-hmm. That's interesting. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's strange. And then to also me. what art do you not like and which art do you find pretentious? And then they'll yeah. say, Oh, well, when I went to the ROM, I saw or or the, the AGO in Toronto, where we're fellow Torontonians here. I saw this and this, and I didn't like the contemporary section, but I like this section. Oh yeah, well, you'll find that there's a a high correlation between the art that you find distasteful or or highbrow and abstract to to remove from what you like and and what's also removed from market pressures. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. But it's it's taken as an article of faith by so many people who don't really reflect on the question very much. It's like, well, I think well, they. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Continue. Yeah, it's taken that, as that, an article of faith. Yes. Yeah, that 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 this is this is obviously for the greater public good, you know, and so the thing is, like, the, the arguments that you'll get is like, it doesn't cost that much in the grand scheme of things, it allows artists to make a living, et cetera, et cetera. But those are the wrong questions to be to be looking at. I think the the, the, the ultimate question is, well, what does your culture look like a hundred years down the line if you pursue this model? You know, what what's going to motivate artists if? Uh, uh, if you know, you can kind of put a trough of public money at their at their disposal and tell them to produce whatever they want. Like there are there are examples of this that are that are so ridiculous they're almost comical. It's like 
I've heard that in uh, in Norway, for example, you can if you're a painter, you can get in on this scheme where you can receive an annual salary from the government to produce your work, right? So they'll they'll pay you whatever it is, you know, the equivalent of a of a decent salary, and you're free. You're free to produce what you want. Where does the art go? It goes into a warehouse. Okay, mm-hmm. nobody ever sees it. <laughs> it's like this kind of thing doesn't seem to me like the indication of a thriving culture. So, Well, this seems like a much larger problem then because in the absence of that, then you just don't have artists producing anything. Well, the majority of artists not producing much because they don't have the money. So what is the, what is the solution? Is the solution for society to value art? Well, then how does, how does that go about? I think that some of the issue is that the artists feel like they make a, they make a false dichotomy between I don't want to produce Marvel movies. I don't want to produce mass media garbage. So, so I must be 100% free from society's pressures. And if I mm-hmm. produce something great, then, but there's also, so in, in computer science, so let me, let me, let me answer a question you asked about, 20 minutes ago. Sure. You're asking, well, what is, what's one way out of giving money to researchers, knowing that most of what they produce is going to be unfruitful? Okay. So one answer is, well, we put a time limit. We say to string theorists, the string program, you have 20 years to deliver. The, the issue with that is that the Hodgkin and Huxley model of the neuron was, I think, from the 60s or so. It could even be the 40s. could be whatever. 19th century, mid, maybe early. It was only later that then we developed neural nets, maybe in the 80s. And then for 40 years or 30 years, neural nets just laid there because they were so inefficient. And then now it's the basis of all of AI. So even if we gave a 20-year cutoff, like we have no idea if some, well... Okay, um, I can counter what I just said, but morally speaking, it's somewhat true. Even if we gave a cutoff and said, okay, you're supposed to produce something in 20 years, something could be fruitful much longer than that. Like the neural nets that I just mentioned, that's the basis of artificial intelligence. Okay, now in artificial intelligence, there's something called a loss function, which is that you, you want to learn something and so there's something you want to conform to. So one way of looking at the successful artist is that society also has a loss function. And the most successful artists, they matched the loss function initially. So the Beatles came out and it was just what people wanted to hear. But then when you match it sufficiently, so you're, okay, you match it sufficiently, then society then goes along with your loss function, which means you have your own personal tastes, but I have to first match societies in order for them to pay attention to me. If they like me enough, then I can actually change society later. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so a couple of things about that. So I think the the attitudes of artists changed quite drastically in the in the 19th century, throughout the 19th century. It was a, it was a fairly long historical process, but they as I as I outlined earlier, they they gradually morphed from being either servants of the nobility or artisans. Uh, to being autonomous individuals who were, to a large degree, in charge of their own production and also of the commercial proceeds from their production. It was possible to make a living through through publishing and other things like this. Um, and um, what you start to see in the in the twentieth century is a is a dramatic acceleration of that. Uh, and then the philosopher Theodore Adorno, uh, who was writing in the uh, in the era between the world wars and also around the the aftermath of world war II, had this idea that you were seeing the emergence of a of a mass culture in north america particularly but not only in north america also in europe and this mass culture was characterized by less of an artisanal tradition in the sense of uh what would you say uh encapsulating the highest the abilities of artists, the most noble aspirations of artists, but rather something that is intended to make a profit and to speak broadly to as many people as possible, and in so doing, to erase uh, the the traces of problematic uh, subjectivity that 
okay. inevitably limit an artist's reach, an, an artist's audience. So you see this, uh, this work that is designed, you know, whether it be pop music or Hollywood or any of these things, that is designed to be as effective as possible in reaching as many people as possible and to make as much money as possible. And so his idea was that the necessary corollary to that uh, was for artists to go in the furthest opposite direction possible, right? So mm -hmm. to position themselves in the opposite extreme of mass culture and to produce something that is difficult, uh, problematic, highly subjective, highly individualized, uh, and uh, that because of this necessarily does not have an audience, Right. He calls this the, the message in a bottle idea. It's, it's like the idea is you're producing this work that has no audience and you're effectively throwing it into the ocean in the hopes that someone somewhere in the future will come across this uh, and take notice of it. And so whether consciously or not, a lot of artists have adopted this as a fundamental axiom. It's like, well, I don't have an audience now and maybe I won't have an audience in 20 years. But maybe in 50 years or 100 years, you know, if my, if my work is preserved long enough, eventually people will come to recognize its quality. Mm -hmm. So the problem with that is it actually does happen sometimes, right? So I'll give you an example from the classical canon. Uh, a composer like Antonio Vivaldi, who was uh, enormously productive in his lifetime. He wrote hundreds and hundreds of concertos, five or 600 of them and pieces in every conceivable genre. He wrote operas and sonatas and all kinds of different pieces. Um, so a colossally productive figure of the Italian Baroque. And he was almost completely forgotten after his death. You know, the, the work just sank into oblivion. And that continued for over 200 years. He was rediscovered uh, in the 20th century. I don't remember what decade, maybe 1950s, as a kind of... Uh, ancillary effect of the phonographic industry. It's like mm. uh, recording became a big thing. Classical music became way more popular because of recordings. There was a much bigger middle class that had time and money to learn to play instruments and were developing sort of niche tastes, I suppose, like classical music. And Vivaldi happened to be especially effective in the medium of recorded music, you know, because the pieces were shortish, they were rhythmic, they were tuneful, they sounded great. And so 200 years later, the work is rediscovered and becomes, uh, he becomes a huge star of the classical world. So things so like that do is, sometimes happen. Yeah, and what's the problem now? Well, the problem is that that doesn't happen it's most rare. of the time. It's extremely yeah. rare. It's exceedingly yeah. rare. And, the, and the, the highest probability outcome is that if you don't have much of an audience in your lifetime, then whatever scant audience you do have is going to evaporate when you're no longer here. Now, how much of this do you think is an artist making excuses for themselves because they inside believe or, did, well, they don't have confidence that they can produce something of value to other people. So then they can say, well, look, it's just my self-expression and, and the society is corrupt. We live in a one that doesn't value the well, one that doesn't value us, and it's not me that's incorrect, it's just it's Marxism or it's capitalism or it's whatever it is. It's something mm -hmm. else. How much of it do you believe it's some excuse that, that it's easier to create and say, look how avant-garde my work is. Mm -hmm. It's just so expressive. It, 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 only other artists can appreciate it. Even comedians have this, by the way. There's the comedian's comedian. Larry David was one. Mm. It's the and Patrice O'Neill was one. It's the comedian that other comedians love, but the audiences, they it just didn't catch on with them. And yeah, it's, Andy it's Cal a badge Andy of, Kaufman. of honor, right? Right, and it's a badge of honor to be a comedian's comedian to a comedian, because you can always say, "Well, I, I it's my genius that's just going unrecognized." So, how much of it do you believe is an excuse that artists put up? Well, it depends. It, it so it, it, it matters what the artist's intentions are. So, for example, uh, you can certainly be a creative person who just finds joy and fulfillment in producing things, right? So 
it's it's something that brings great meaning to your life to to write poetry, to compose music, and you're not necessarily thinking thinking of it in professional terms or in in terms of communicating with an audience. It's just it's something that you do as an expression of 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 who you are. Uh, and you know if that's the case, if you're uh, you know if you're working in a completely unrelated field, if you're a dentist or whatever, and you're passionate about photography, and every weekend you're out shooting. Uh, but you're not seeking to show the work or be a professional, then who could possibly have an issue with that? You know, I think there, and, and there's lots of people who fit into that category, by the way. Uh, there are lots and lots of creative people who aren't in creative industries or who aren't attempting to be professionals. So it, well, it matters on that level. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you know this, but my background's in filmmaking. So yeah. mathematical physics, yes, but then I, I did stand up comedy and then I went into filmmaking. And so I'm intimately familiar with the Toronto scene of filmmaking. In fact, I had an incubator for filmmakers. And what you see often is, is not just I'm creating because I, I like it. Maybe it starts off like that, but then it, init- then it turns into disappointment, which then turns into bitterness towards society and mm-hmm. an elevation of themselves as an, of an artist that just goes, that's, that's just not heralded as much as they should be. Because yeah. The, so, because in Toronto my, is, is corrupt or, or Canada or whatever it may be. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So in my experience, a lot of the people that are are pursuing it out of a genuine love for the medium and out of a genuine desire for expression, when it's authentic, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if they're a physician or a dentist or an accountant or whatever, and that's what they do. Like the, the, the impulse is, is the most important thing. Uh, and you're likely to see a lot of professionals who are pursuing it for reasons other than that, I believe. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons that that might motivate someone to try to pursue this professionally, and, and they might have very little to do with creativity or expression. Which is not to say that there's never any overlap between those things, because of course there is. I would think of it as a, as a Venn diagram. There are points of intersection, right? There are people who are pursuing art professionally, and there are people who are creative, and sometimes they overlap, and sometimes they don't. Uh, but I think there are a lot of people who are drawn to the what they imagine to be the 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 prestige and the legitimation in other people's mm-hmm. eyes that can come from being being an artist and and a lot of that legitimation by the way comes not from the the public per se but rather from curators administrators other artists you know that that small circle of people that make up the art world so i think that's probably an intractable problem i don't know that you can mm-hmm. prevent those sorts of circular uh, in-groups from forming uh, and from looking after their own interests. I think that's just part of human nature. But what I've observed is that the, the problem is like the, the genuinely eccentric people who tend to be the great artists, the ones who uh, are obsessed by an idiosyncratic vision, are the ones who are least likely to succeed in those kinds of environments, in my experience. Hmm. Now, occasionally, one can sort of slip through. That does happen. You get these phenomenally gifted, creative people who can also succeed in that world. But very often, those two things don't go together very well at all. So, Sam, some of the parallels here between what you brought up initially, which is that string theory iceberg, and these experimental artists, is this... this quality of not being understood by the majority of people. So even Eric Weinstein, there's this tweet. Well, Eric called me after that, that string theory iceberg video. And he said, what may, what's like one of the greatest compliments that doesn't sound like a compliment. He said, Kurt, even I didn't understand most of that. And I was like, are you <laughs> serious? That's, that's pretty darn cool. Like I didn't think that I could create a video where, but, but anyhow, the, the point is that other artists, it's something that I've seen and that I, I've seen in myself because when I created films, I would tell myself it's, it's just above people's heads. And then, and, and man, if they were just, if they just knew more, they would appreciate it. And maybe later generations, maybe the critics and that's, it's, I can be a filmmaker's filmmaker. Yeah. So I've seen it in myself. I've seen it in others. 
you mentioned that it's an intractable problem. You also mentioned that there's a lack of podcast in the for artists. Do you think this is why? Oh yeah, absolutely. I definitely think that's why. Um, yeah, I mean, again, sometimes that does happen. Like sometimes the work um, does eventually find find its way towards a, a greater audience. But it could also be the case that you just suck at communicating, right? And that like you've got <laughs> you've got creative impulses, but you're not able to formulate them in a way that anybody wants to connect with. And to just wave that away and say, well, you know, that's because people have to get smarter or they have to, Uh you know, they they need time to appreciate what it is that I'm doing uh, is often, I think, a kind of smokescreen. So Yeah, the problem lies elsewhere other than yourself is what people, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, And and when you say you have an issue with communicating, you don't mean marketing. You don't mean that you've produced a great product, it just needs to be marketed correctly. You mean that the product itself isn't that great. Yeah, that's the likeliest scenario. Although, like marketing, <laughs> see, artists are allergic to the term marketing. They they get a bit funny when you when you talk about that. But it, that I'm might aware. also be part of it. That might also be part of it. It's like if you if you have no ability, this, this is like like marketing is is the is the twenty first century term. But you know, if you, if you were in the the sixteenth or the seventeenth century and living in Venice or Paris or wherever. Marketing would have consisted of your ability to convince people to go along with your projects and to fund them and to commission them and to, you know, and, and to be to to have the relational skills also for that to happen in the first place. And it's like, I don't know of any artists in history that didn't have to contend with that on some level. Like, okay, there are a few edge cases here and there of people who are completely isolated, who produced work that was outside of any kind of social or uh, commercial network of any kind, and it was discovered after their death. That does happen. Right? There, there's, a, there's a category called outsider art, for example. There's a, a an artist, uh, I can't remember where he lived, somewhere in the U.S., called Henry Darger, D-A-R-G-E-R, who was, who was a mentally disabled janitor who produced uh, enormous quantities of really quite remarkable paintings and stories and all, all kinds of things that were discovered after his death. Nobody knew he was up to this. There's a photographer mm. called Vivian Meyer who who uh, stalked the streets mm-hmm. of Chicago right for decades during her lifetime, never told anybody what she was doing. It turns out she was one of the great street photographers of all time. And there was this box of thousands of, of negatives that were discovered upon her death. You know, she was working as a nanny, right? There's, there, are, there are stories like this. But the thing is, those stories get an enormous amount of attention. And then we think, oh, that's actually, that's a possible outcome, right? That, that could be the fate that's awaiting me. But I mean, it's unbelievably unlikely that that will happen to anybody. And producing the work, formulating it in such a manner that others can appreciate it uh, and will be will be drawn to it, is something like a Darwinian advantage in the arts, right? So, so let me lay out this idea. I mentioned the fact earlier that in opera you have this coming together of popular and savant styles. So Mozart is the epitome of that. You can listen to operas like The Magic Flute or Don Giovanni. And, you know, anybody, if you if you read the text, watch the action on the stage and listen to the music, anybody, I don't care how, uh, you know, uncultured they think they are or how deaf to music they think they are, anybody can appreciate those operas. They're, they're incredibly fun. They're beautiful. They have a, like a dramaturgical dimension to them. They're tuneful. They're entertaining. They're captivating. Etc. Right. So there, there's there's a level of the first encounter with the artwork that is immediately seductive. Right. So so if you're coming to that work for the first time, even though you might not understand anything about it, you might not understand Italian, you might not understand the dramaturgical or the musical conventions of the time. But there's there's a level of immediate seduction that just draws you in. And then you know it's like once that's in place, you're willing to go along with the artist. You know, you'll follow them because it's like, okay, there's there's something here that is compelling. You know, mm-hmm. compelling in in the, in the sense that a flower is compelling for a bee. It's like you want to go towards it, and you don't think about it. And there's a lot of art I'm seeing, uh, certainly in my field, where that initial encounter, that surface level, uh, is simply not taken into consideration whatsoever. It's like the the artist will try to deliver the substance of their idea, but they won't provide the thing that makes you want to interact with the idea in the first place. So that's 
obviously, we're, we're getting into abstractions here because I'm not actually citing specific artists or, or artworks, but you'll have to, I suppose, take it uh, on faith that what I'm sure. describing is, 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 a, is a widespread phenomenon. So you're getting this art that, that may have something compelling about it somewhere, um, and it may encapsulate something that is interesting, but you don't want to listen to it. It sounds awful, you know? Or, or it sounds maybe not awful, but incomprehensible. Or there, there isn't a level upon which anyone but a highly trained specialist can even have the slightest idea what's going on. So there's room for a certain amount of art like that, right? And especially, it's like if you're just, if you're doing that and you're funding it yourself and you've got a circle of followers, then fine. But when that becomes extremely widespread and when it's inevitably publicly funded and that's the only way that it can survive in any form, then it starts to have, I think, bizarre effects on the culture. Can you walk me through an example with an artist that that the majority of people would know, like Beethoven or Da Vinci or Michelangelo, where they had feelings of, I wish I could just produce on my own, but then their work was improved, not just that they surrendered to the, to the market forces, but their work was improved because they had to now think about the audience. Maybe it could be Shakespeare, it could be something like that, because then this can serve as an inspirational story to people who are, who, who feel like they're down on their luck and, and they're the, the talent that is, is well unrecognized yeah well i think in the in the 18th and 19th centuries it was not uncommon for artists to have two hats that they could wear right there would be a a public facing hat let's say and there would be one that would be more inward right so there would be things that they would write maybe for themselves or for a small circle of friends and then there, there would be things that they would do that would be more public facing uh, Beethoven's a good example of that. So, so Beethoven in his chamber music, for example, is writing things that are often, some, they're, they're sometimes quite accessible and, and totally unproblematic, but they're sometimes unbelievably strange, rebarbative, esoteric, uh, and forward thinking, radically forward thinking. So and you is, call this, this chamber music? Referring chamber music. to what? what yeah, so... Mean? Okay, okay. So, so in, in classical music, there are genres that are public-facing. In other words, that are, that are intended for large performance spaces, large venues like concert halls, uh, opera houses, and so yeah, on. Yeah, understood, yeah. Okay, and so chamber music is historically not something that's intended to be played in a public venue per se, but rather played among friends or played in a right, private okay, setting, got it. played yeah. in a salon. Okay, so... so our understanding of this, our, our view of this, has changed certainly uh, in the in the well throughout the 20th century and also today by the fact that uh, these works that were not necessarily intended to be played in public are now constantly played in public and and in increasingly large halls as well. So you can take a, a string quartet uh, that might have been played for 10 people and now you can play it in front of 2,000 people easily. Uh, so so there's that. But anyway, so so Beethoven had the capacity to write things that he would have known mm-hmm. were, uh, were less comprehensible to most people that were esoteric, but that allowed him to push the limits of his art. But he was also capable at the same time of writing things like the Ode to Joy and the last movement of the Ninth Symphony, which is uh, his attempt at reconciling mm. the, the, the savant and the popular styles. He didn't exceed to the same extent, succeed to the same extent as Mozart did, by the way. He didn't have those kinds of public successes on the same scale. But there's an attempt there to include everybody. You know, it's, this, it's this idea that I'm going to wrap my arms around the entire world. Everybody's allowed in. Everybody's welcome. You know, And to produce something in an explicitly popular style. So you know, if Beethoven, who's one of the greatest musicians who ever lived, can do that, you know, if he can write things that are popular, he, he even wrote some pieces that are totally trivial, by the way. Like, it's like... You write for the occasion. Sometimes that's what's necessary. Sometimes you need a piece for that evening for a dance. And it's like, you, it, it's not going to be 
some immortal work of art, but it's going to be what a spontaneous exercise of your technical facility, and it's going to fulfill the requirements of the occasion. You can't cut all of that out from art and only produce the things that are uh, the most esoteric. You can, you can, but it's like you do so at a loss, I believe. Explain to me the commercial appeal of Mozart's scatological lyrics. Huh. Like, is this just, is, is this false? Is this a myth that I've heard? Or is it actually no, no. true? No, 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 it's actually so true. explain this to me, please. Yeah, yeah, well, commercial, and, I don't, <laughs> these were not things that were, that were published or even performed during his lifetime, but... Uh, oh, but, okay, okay. No, 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 the, but these, uh, there, are, there are some unbelievably uh, body, uh, B-A-W-D-Y, uh, works in Mozart's catalog that were enclosed in letters or that were that were sent privately to people, and uh, it's <laughs> it's part of his personality, clearly. Uh, so that would be chamber music. Yeah, some of them are choral works. There's a there's one famous canon called "Lech mir im Arsch," which means "Lick me in the ass." That is in, yes, uh, yes, I've yeah, heard yeah. that. Right, right, right. That's but a, it's that's a it's music that we. Canon. It was playing, and then I recognized this as a Mozart song, a popular Mozart song. So it became popular afterward, but it wasn't at the time. You said, "Well, I wouldn't say that those works are popular exactly. They're 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 known because there's a fascination with Mozart as a as a character, as a person, and that fascination uh. was was greatly accelerated by the the Milos Forman film Amadeus." Uh, but I think no. I think there's a there's a popular fascination with this idea of somebody who really was, in many respects, a kind of uh, eternal child, uh, and uh, who was capable of producing the most heavenly, the most exquisite compositions. But that at the same time had this very human dimension, and was you know had a stupid sense of humor, and was prone to all kinds of uh, mortal folly and you know bad behavior and things like that, and. It humanizes him. There are there are figures of classical music that appear to us to be much more remote, much more difficult to to grasp as as people as humans. Bach is one of those. Like there there's there are very few concrete biographical elements for Bach in terms of his own personality. Uh, you know, he left almost no writings whatsoever. Extremely few letters. We just there's just a few anecdotes here and there, but we don't really have access to you know, the, the, his detailed psychobiography in the way that we do with Mozart. So, mm -hmm. uh, so Bach appears to be almost incomprehensible. This kind of, uh, we'll never be able to understand how it was possible for one man to produce that much work of such an extraordinarily high level throughout his entire life without interruption. There are things like that that are, that are just hard to fathom. What's then the goal for Sam? Huh. The goal for me. I don't know that there is a goal. I think there's a process. I think there's a process. And you don't get to choose your participation in that process. That That's something that I think maybe a lot of people don't necessarily grasp, is we have this idea that, you know, uh, you were an artist, you chose to be an artist, you could have you could have done something else. I could not have done something else. I I did not have the ability to choose a different life than this. So the, it comes from an, an inner compulsion to, to produce work. And you hope that the work will land, that it will communicate something, and that it will be a value. But the producing of the work itself is not in line with a goal, per se, or at least not with me. Um, it's, it's, almost, it's almost involuntary in nature. And I don't mean to be mystical about that or anything like that. It's just... Uh, you know, it's something that if, if you don't do it, then it will crush you. You know, it's like you won't be able to function. So that's that's one thing. But I think in a larger sense, what I'm trying to do and, and something I'm very preoccupied with and have been for a few years is it's not so much that I'm in the process of reconsidering my musical language fundamentally or anything like that, but I've become much more acutely aware of the well, partly through doing the podcast and partly through meeting people like you and a lot of other people that I met at ARC and people that I've met over the past few years is an awareness of the much 
bigger world outside of the field that I'm involved in. So to put that in context, when I was a student at the Paris Conservatory, I was surrounded by other composers, other musicians, by teachers who broadly shared the same values that I did at that time, uh, and really had very little contact with the broader culture outside of that, which mm -hmm. can lead one very easily to make categorical errors, right? So one of them is the music that me and my peers are making uh, that has this legitimation within this small world, that this is, by default, this is the music of today. And if people aren't engaging with that, then that's their problem and they're missing out. And um, I think one of the things that I've become really ac acutely aware of is, uh, is just how just how big the world is, how many people there are out there who certainly don't share that point of view and uh, whose listening habits might be extremely different, but who also have a profound experience of music in all of its forms. So I suppose what I'm trying to do right now is to is to bridge worlds and to, you know, try to take my own impulses and share them with as many people as possible. And uh, it's daunting, man. It's not easy. And the other yeah, thing that goes imagine. goes along with that, it's like, as you know, because you're you're increasingly a major public figure. It's like when you're in the public eye, uh, you can't hide behind this. Uh, and not that I ever hid behind anything, but I mean, it's like you, you are answerable to what you say and to what you produce. And if it's not landing and if it's like, if you're wasting people's time, then that's going to be immediately explicitly obvious and you won't be able to continue. Well, here's what's fascinating about the podcast scene or the YouTube scene is that there's this curse and a blessing called the algorithm. So people don't like it, but at the same time, YouTube is trying desperately to find an audience for you. So you put out something and then it's showing it to someone and do they like it? No. Okay. Let me try someone else. Let me try someone else. Oh, this type of person likes it. Let me try with more of those types of people. And it finds an audience for you. And I'm curious, there's in video games, there's indie games, the rise of indie games, which it's interesting because there were no indie games in the eighties and the nineties. I mean, again, there are exceptions, but now you would think that it would move toward the blockbusters, the triple A, they're called triple A video games and just be triple A video games. But there's the rise of the single A video game and even the double A video game, the mid game, the middle, the middle A, the double A video game. So that's not via the algorithm of YouTube because it's not like YouTube distributes video games. But I'm wondering then if there's, if there's hope here. Is it the case that the population, the general public, sorry, is more interested in varied music? So that, I don't know, are people's tastes more varied than they've ever been? Because you can make the argument that, okay, yes, we can produce more. There are more listeners, though, so there's hope. However, those listeners, they only listen to a small subset of people most of the time. Some Pareto distribution argument. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the correct argument or if it's actually the case that people nowadays listen to more music, more watch more types of, or listen to more artistic pieces that are more varied than they have in the past. I can imagine that's the case merely because it's available to them minus 200 years ago. You wouldn't hear someone from India or from Africa or whatever. Maybe it wouldn't even be on the menu. And the same with mm -hmm. food, like literally on the menu. You don't have certain... Yeah, unless you live near the spice trade, you don't have international food. You don't have that concept. It's just lard and bread. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Which which direction do you think it goes? Well, I, I see it as, as, as an enormously positive sign. No question. Uh, of, of course, there are potential pitfalls. And these mass platforms are subject to capture just as anything gigantic is. And there are risks associated with that. But in terms of the the potential audience for artists, I mean, give me a break. This is this is this is insane. Like that that was the that was the the basic tenor of my arc speech. Also, is that like if you if you can compare, you know, my modest professional achievements with those of any major twentieth century composer, pretty much from the first half of the twentieth century, 
or even a lot of 19th century composers, there are, with some exceptions. But I mean, most of them had an audience that was way smaller than mine. And I'm, I'm not claiming for a second that I'm a particularly notable or, or a famous musician or anything like that. I'm just pointing out that the number of people that I can access um, via this technology, and not just the technology, because it also translates into physical audience numbers at concerts and other things like that, hmm, uh, yeah. is, is, is vastly bigger than would have been the case otherwise. There's no question. So, uh, and also it, it does seem that people are simply engaging a lot more with a lot of this material. And it's like all the barriers have been removed, right? The, it used to be the case in my, in my lifetime, like in my memory, when I was starting to study composition, there were pieces that I couldn't hear because the only recording was out of print or, you know, the score was $300 and you had to order it from Czechoslovakia or something. It's like those barriers don't exist anymore. The the totality of human cultural production is available pretty much, with some exceptions. But I think gradually those gaps will get filled. No, I understand. Yeah, it's remarkable. You know, it's 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 absolutely so. So there's there's no there's no reason. Uh, there are no roadblocks at all to 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 engaging with this material, except perhaps you know, lack of interest. Uh, you might not have heard about it. There is a lot of noise now in the, in the signal. So it's hard to figure out what are the things that you should be paying attention to. But, uh, but no, it's a, it, it's an extraordinary time. There's never been a time like this in history for artists. And so what I want to encourage people to do, and, and this is the, the hope and the message I think is, is to recognize that there are so many creative people who are still stuck in this kind of very old fashioned model, I think, that no longer has a future at all. I think it's, you know, it's, it's like there are still vestiges of it that are functional. There's, there's still an infrastructure that's in place. And so you can point to it and say, yes, but, you know, there's still this and that, and there's still grants, and there's still uh, this network of professionals and so on. But I really don't believe that world has much of a future. It'll probably continue to exist indefinitely in some kind of a form. But it's like you could be trying to squeeze through that tiny little narrow aperture. Or you mm -hmm. could move a few steps over and walk through this giant open gate, you know, into this undreamt of world. And that's what I'm encouraging people to do. It's like, see what you can, see what you can make and see how many people you can connect with. So it's like, yeah, it's, it's partly a generational thing that there are older colleagues of mine that will never see things that way. And that will, you know, forever be, what, uh, disappointed about the way things have gone culturally. They'll see it as a, you know, it's like this, this great thing that we had in the 60s and 70s is, is vanishing. It was disappearing and instead everybody's glued to their screens. But I don't see it that way at all. I think it's a, it's a time of unbelievable potential. So. Well, that sounds like a great place to wrap it up. I have to get going, and it's such a hopeful message. I don't know if I could top that. Well, before you go, uh, we should point out that uh, your channel is called Theories of Everything, and it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing channel. I've watched it myself on a regular basis, and uh, I love the work you're doing. I think, uh, I think you are bringing something quite new to the, the podcast world. It can be done, um, and because uh, there are a lot of podcast clones out there, but I think what you're doing really is, uh, is quite distinctive. So to the extent, so? again, that, oh, well, you have a, a technical grasp of, of very esoteric subjects that you're extremely good at communicating with a broad range of people. And there's a real sense of not just merely asking questions of your guests, but actually interacting with them and pushing back and, and asking for clarification. And you're also covering topics that are I think difficult to popularize and succeeding at that. So all of those things I think are, are major pluses. So something that I take from filmmaking is that there's a saying that the quality of your film is the quality of what's left on the cutting room floor. I don't know if you've hmm. heard that before. No, that's good. But so I have a marketer as much as artists don't like that word. I have a marketing guy, let's say, and he's constantly pushing me to interview the same people that are on the diary of the CEO or, or Chris mm -hmm. Williamson or all these other platforms and it, or Andrew Huberman. And I feel like 
man, I am trying, this is the artist in me. I'm trying to create mm-hmm. something distinctive here. I want to demarcate myself. And it's also, I'm just not interested, even though that if I interviewed these, these same set of guests that are on the podcast circuit repeatedly, and they're known mm-hmm. for bringing in large numbers that I could get similar numbers. But I have such a distaste for that because I'm just not in, my heart's not in it. And it's this constant battle. And so I, I, I then say, okay, well, in filmmaking, the quality of your film is in large part the quality of what's left on the cutting room floor. So an example to be less abstract is there's a, well, I guess I'm going to speak it in a bit more of an abstraction because I can't find this specific example. But there is this movie where the, lar- the, the most budget, the most, most of the budget went into this one shot. It was like $3 million for this explosion or whatever it may be. And it just didn't fit the film. It was three minutes and it took like two weeks to film. And they just had to cut it. And the film was successful. And if, the film, it's escaping me, but I could ask ChatGPT in like a couple of minutes to get the, the answer if you like. Or people who are listening can. And that's, it's just, well, so I run myself, I run the podcast in part with that adage. And then also from Seinfeld and Larry David with, with Seinfeld, they had two rules, no hugging, no learning. So I have some no's on the, yeah, I I don't, yeah, you know about this. So for people who don't, Seinfeld is a remarkable sitcom. To me, it's, man, Breaking Bad for drama is Seinfeld for comedy. Mm. It's superlative. And they had rules which just went against the entire conventions of the, of, the, of the field. So their field was sitcoms. Every sitcom had a lesson at the end, and then there was hugging, there was the Cosby show, and even Friends and so on, which copied Seinfeld but went back to the old sitcom ways of learning and, and modeling scenes. And Seinfeld said, no, we're going to have no hugging, no learning. And it's just some selfish people who are unlikable. Like, how could you ever pitch that? We're going to have four characters who are unlikable. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I yeah. know. Yeah, no, I love it. I, well, I, I memorized probably every episode of Seinfeld. Um, yeah, yeah, I've, same, I've same. I've watched it I've many, many times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, a bit bef- yeah. just before you go, because uh, I, I, know, I know you've got a, a heart out, but uh, yeah, no, I think this is a d- dilemma that's faced by every podcaster to some degree. Uh, is that um, there are things that you can do that are demonstrated to work, but that result in a high degree of homogenization of of the shows. And it's like you see the same guests again and again on different shows with different interviewers mm-hmm. talking about the same topics. Yes. And it gets stale very easily. It's it's not that the people aren't interesting. It's just that there's only so many times you can have the same conversation, you know, with minimal variations. Uh, so, so yeah, no, I, I think, uh, well, you can think of it as, as like a funnel. It's like there are going to be guests that, you know, we're going to draw more people and they can serve as a magnet to draw people to the, the things that would perhaps not get as large an audience otherwise. So, you know, everybody has to figure out what proportion works for them. But, uh, so. Yeah. And then the alternate way of viewing it is, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So the alternative is that people aren't static. So if you were to interview, say Huberman, it wouldn't be Huberman. It'd be Huberman with Sam. And that's a different mm-hmm. side of Huberman or Huberman mm-hmm. with Kurt or whatever it may be. So mm-hmm. that's what my marketing guy tells me and some other people tell me. I'm still resistant to that because that's, again, the rebellious artist contrarian in me. But we'll see. Maybe there's some sacrifice of, okay, one in every 10 episodes will be a lead magnet person. I don't know. We'll see. But yeah, it yeah. would have to be, my heart would have to be in it and I'd have to find a way to reframe it for myself or that I find an, a different angle. Like if I'm speaking to Huberman, just to pick on him, it would be about it would be about learning mathematics and physics. Like, what particular tips do you have for for philosophers or the the theories of everything audience? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, definitely you you can always find a an unexpected angle. So, for example, I I interviewed a a young Scottish composer a few months ago, uh, uh-huh. and you know I could have asked him the usual questions about his work, and but I started with a question about uh, about extraterrestri- extraterrestrial life and mm-hmm. what the music of other civilizations might be like if they didn't have anything like the same physical conditions that we have here on Earth. And that ended up being a way more interesting discussion, you know, because it was completely from out of left field. 
And um, so, yeah, I mean, when, when you're interviewing somebody, I think you have an obligation to not ask them the questions that, that have already been asked, you know, and, and not, I think, it, is it Williamson who said something like, I, I try not to ask questions that you can just Google and find the answer to. So hmm. that's a good rule of thumb, I think. Mm-hmm. Thank you for inviting me, Sam. It was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Hope we can do it again sometime. Thanks for your time, Kurt. Yeah, especially in person. Absolutely.